When, when I was younger, my experience was, you know, I first went to a psychotherapist when I was about 12. And, you know, their, their questions to me, because of the way I was suffering with my anxiety, mm -hmm. which was quite severe at a young age, was, um, had I been abused? Mm -hmm. Had I been bullied? You know, and neither of those things had happened to me. And it just felt as though um, they were just going for obvious reasons why a child may be showing these signs of anxiety at such a young yeah. age. Do you think that from then that the physicians have more understanding in anxiety from young children right through to adults? Well, I think we do. I mean, first of all, those are reasonable questions to ask yeah. because they are causes of anxiety, depression. You don't really have to be a psychiatrist to know that. But equally, we also know anxiety is determined by temperament and indeed genes also play a part. There yeah. are genes that increase the risks of anxiety as well. And some people just are more anxious than others for you know, genetic or unknown reasons. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a battle I've had because it's something I've suffered with all my life and all of my family, my, my, my siblings all suffer with some form of anxiety yeah. or depression. My mother did, some of my cousins do. So for me, it was you know, battling the fact that this can't just be my mind overtaking, you know, making me so irrational right through my life. It has to be something physical. So for me, that has been a big question. As you've just said, it can be genetic because I believe that mine is, must be partly genetic because there's, there's no way that I can feel this anxious and get this depressed and have had it all my life when I have an understanding of it sometimes, but then when the irrational mind kicks in. Mm. You know, so I just feel because of my family, of well, of all suffered. I just feel as though it must be a genetic thing, but that's something that hasn't really been an answer to me before, before you've said it now. Hmm. No one's really come up with, yes, you know, this could be a genetic disorder. Well, I mean, these things are very rarely either or in life. So we know that people can inherit genes that predispose them to anxiety, but we also know it's the interaction. We, we rather boringly call it gene environment interaction. Um, that will most often be implicated. So you mean like nurture, like yes, from what nurture. I've learned from my from my mum yes. who was very anxious and so the family is Well that that's a very good example in the sense that you can inherit through you know something similar but in different ways. So you inherit a genetic predisposition but if also you live in a family where there is a lot of anxiety, for example, in your parents, you'll also inherit a kind of different environment yeah. and way of reacting that you will learn. So that's a beautiful example, really, of the two coming together, gene and environment, leading to then the actual disorder that we would see clinically. So, yeah. you know, you, you should be in an exam. We should use you to teach well, medical when I, students. Well, when, when, was, when I was younger, like, I'd say through my... Uh, you know, I, I went to a different school from my sister. Mm. I went to a stage school in London. And I'd say from the age of 15 through till 30, 35, I didn't go to family weddings. Um, I, I, being in the family environment would create my anxiety. So that's how, you know, I felt as though it was part of the nurture because being surrounded by, mm. you know, so many people who suffer the same kind of thing put me in a state of anxiety. So, but the genetic thing is something that, mm. for me, is important for, I think, my mental stability because when you do suffer with such anxiety and then it turns into depression, yep. then you do start questioning your sanity sometimes because you're so irrational and you, you know it's your mind which is doing this, but you have no control of it. And to explain that to other people, like family members, who, like my, my husband, for example, who's very level-headed, never suffered with this form of anxiety, or, you know, just normal every day. It's very hard for someone to understand how you can create this and put yourself in such a state of anxiety and then fall into a deep yep. state of depression. It's really difficult for someone to understand how you can do that to yourself. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, as you just said, everyone gets anxious. And getting anxious, getting worried before exams, you know, divorces, yeah. going into hospital is completely normal. And that's just part of the human condition. And um, people then say, well, when does it become a problem? And I think it's the intensity of symptoms. But most importantly, when it starts to interfere with your life, mm. when it makes it difficult to hold relationships, when you can't, you know, go off to work, when you can't get into a crowded tube yeah. train or fly a plane, uh, fly on a yeah. plane, I should say. I've had yeah. all of those. Yes. And then that's getting into a clinical disorder where it's not just the normal anxiety that, you know, literally everybody watching this has experienced unless there's something yeah. really strange. 
And that's when people like me start to take an interest, not least because there are things that we can actually do to help. Yeah, I mean, I suffered all of those, planes, lifts, tubes, yep. anything that was enclosed, anything that I didn't have control of. Um, and it got to a state of, there was one point where I became agrophobic and I actually couldn't go out. I couldn't go to supermarkets, mm. I couldn't walk down aisles where people were coming at me. You know, I had every kind of symptom of that. But um, for me, it was also finding the right person, not to diagnose me, but to understand me. Some doctors I went to, I was on the 10 minute slot. There was no empathy, there was, it was just take some medication which I didn't want to do in my earlier life because I'd seen my family members who had taken medication, it had changed their personality and it had made them quite numb and it, unemotional. You know, it's something that I've, I've just started medication about 14 months ago and it has changed my life. It really has. It's only a small dosage, it hasn't changed my personality. I just feel as though the cup is half full. I've never had a problem talking about it but it was finding the right treatment for me. But I believe there's a huge amount of the population out there suffering with anxiety and depression. And I believe they, they are at the level I was as well, where yeah. I became, you know, housebound. Um, literally, I would be in such a deep, dark hole after the anxiety, the depression kicked mm. in, where, you know, I, w I found it easier not to speak to people because if I spoke to them then it was I'd have to think about something else where I was so consumed with my anxiety and the depression that I couldn't come out of this cloud because I could talk in my head to myself yep. to make me feel you know I understand I don't want your opinion I don't want to speak to you you know it, and I think there's lots of people out there who are going undiagnosed with this. But I think what you just said also about talking there well, another thing that has changed is that in this country we've actually pioneered very good talking therapies, uh, psychotherapies for anxiety, which now have been made available to you know, over a million people. So it, it absolutely is not just drugs. Yeah. Indeed, in the first instance, if possible, we would refer you to actually do talk about yeah. it, particularly to some, some, uh, to, to some form of trained professional. And that's been a big change in the last decade, actually, which again, um, wasn't available when, yeah. when we were younger. I've never wanted to, no matter how dark I was, I've never wanted to die or commit suicide. Sometimes I thought it'd be easier if I wasn't here because I wouldn't mm. have to cope with this constant struggle every day. But I never had the thought of, I'm going to kill myself. You know, I love life. It's just that I couldn't enjoy my life. Yes. So I was having a battle of how do I, how do I enjoy this life? You know, I have a good life. You know, I've been very fortunate. You know, people would look and think, you know, I've had, you know, success in what I do. You know, I'm financially okay. But all of that mm. is totally irrelevant when this dark cloud comes on yeah. and takes over. You know, and like I say, when I was in that state, I never wanted to die as in I want to kill myself. I wanted to live, but I didn't know how to live. I couldn't mm. get out of this hole. And that was the battle I was having. I have a good life. Why can't I enjoy it? Mm. Why can't I be happy? Am I ever going to be happy? You know, because of, like, my life has been wonderful, but then I had some really good fortune. I, you know, I became famous, which it wasn't about the fame, but with that, you get privilege. And, you know, anyone would think that money, fame, success is, you know, going to make you so happy and wonderful. It made absolutely no difference at all. In fact, it made it worse. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what... I was trying to, I was just trying to find what will make me happy. I just want to be happy. I just want to live every day of my life and just wake up and be happy. And my mum passed about three years ago and she was only 22 years old. She died 20, uh, you know, she had me when she was 22. And I think from then as well, I've been battling that I have to enjoy every day. I have to enjoy my life because, you know, it can be taken away. I see that when my mum passed. And I think that's something is... When you get older as well, it's battling to enjoy what you've got. And I feel as though I waste every day, I'm depressed or anxious, yeah. but I can't stop it. And I mean, there's a school of thought that says actually we shouldn't be happy every day and to expect us to be in a state of perpetual bliss is actually so unrealistic when life tells us that that's not the case. It actually mm. does make us worse. But I mean, what, one, of the, one of the reasons that we think that anxiety has gone up, particularly in young women, actually does relate to what you're saying because of course 
you know, the price of fame isn't just the kind of fame that you've had. Absolutely. On a more local dimension, uh, social media, for example, accelerates that feeling of yeah. always being watched, having to be beautiful, having to be successful. Everyone has that lives in a kind of aura of fame at the moment. Yeah. And a lot of people think that that has contributed to making people more anxious. Yeah.